guys and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be doing a presentation for you guys. So I'm down in the corner here in case you can't see me. So today's episode is going to be on nature conservation in the United Kingdom. Now for those of you who aren't aware, the UK is composed of four countries. So we've got England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how kind of nature conservation and geoconservation link between the four in today's presentation. So I really hope you guys enjoy joy. So the key points I'm going to address is what is nature conservation, where did it come from and how has it evolved over the past centuries in the UK and what laws are there to protect um, nature conservation in areas of natural beauty and the different types and networks that exist and then how does geological heritage play out in these areas because it is an upcoming topic so how is it being separated from the more well-known biodiversity and nature conservation that we know today and then I'm also going to talk about a little bit on the future plans and goals for the UK. So first things first, what is nature conservation? So in its simplest form, it's preserving and protecting the environment for future generations to enjoy. So we do that by restoring habitats, preventing species from unnecessary extinction and protecting the biological diversity of areas. So a bit about the origins of nature conservation, I thought I would start with the National Trust. Now I'm sure many of you know the National Trust and it was founded in 1895 by three people um, called Octavia Hill, Sir Robert Hunter and Canon Hardwick Ronsley. Now the interesting about these three, they all had a passion for the environment, but not just nature, they wanted to preserve historical and cultural values as well. So whether that's in a property or a garden or an amazing area of natural beauty. Now, the interesting thing about these three is Sir Robert Hunter was actually a lawyer. So he was able to not just have a passion for the environment, but also put into play the legislations required to protect it. So that's where the National Trust Act came from in 1907 and has since kind of evolved over time to keep these areas protected. And the National Trust today now manages eight out of 32 of the World Heritage Sites in the UK. So a bit more on the National Trust, a bit about their history. So in 1895, they were given their first plot of land, which was five acres in Wales. And we can see the little picture here. And then I also thought I would say where they got their first property for a whopping 10 pounds in 1896. And then in 1899, they obtained their first nature reserve, which was two acres of Wickham Fen near Cambridge. So another origins of nature conservation in the UK was Charles Rothschild. Now the Rothschild family was a very wealthy one. Most of them were bankers and Charles Rothschild wasn't different from this. He was also a banker, but he had a passion for wildlife. So in 1912, he founded an organization which went on to become the wildlife trusts, which we have today. So by 1915, he and his organization had compiled a list of 284 sites worthy of preservation, which got the label the Rothschild Reserves. So we can see in the map here where the sites were distributed. Um, and this is Charles Rothschild. And so in these blue envelopes here, he did one for every site. So there's 284 of them. And he did kind of like a questionnaire on each of the sites on why they should be protected. What is it about that site that is worthy of its preservation? And unfortunately, they were all worthy of protection. However, there was no legalities around it. So that's the mistake Charles Rothschild made. He you know, went through all the efforts to single out the sites worthy of protection, but you know, over time development and other planning uses have panned out. And so many have been lost or partially lost due to this development. However, those that were not lost have since been categorized as SSSIs, which are sites of significant uh, sites of significant scientific interest or given a nature reserve status, which means they are now under the protection of the law. So another origins of nature conservation is the RSPB. So this is the Society for the Protection of Birds. And this was founded by Emily William Mason in 1889. And um, she basically didn't, the, the women would have these headdresses that would have, you know, large portions of a bird on them. And obviously that wasn't good for their conservation or their habitats and was leading to ex unnecessary extinction of many bird species. So she started the society and in its earliest days, the society consisted entirely of women and the members 
membership costs two pence and the rules for the society were that the members shall discourage the unnecessary destruction of birds and interest themselves generally in their protection and that lady members shall refrain from wearing the feathers of any bird not killed for purposes of food with the exception of the ostrich. Now I'm unsure why the ostrich was, ex was an exception so if any of you know that would be <laughs> very interesting but the RSPB went on to pass acts on uh, the prohibition of importa importation of plumage in 1921 and then they obtained their first nature reserve in 1930 and then now they um, work on an international scale now so it's a really amazing organization so this is a little bit about the evolution of nature conservation so this isn't all the organizations that um, work together to you know make it what it is today but they're just a few of the ones i've spoken about and a few extra so we can see here and there's also the NERC foundation that I think is 1965 was created so that goes about there which is also a very important one so a bit about the legalities surrounding nature so well not just nature nature conservation in the uk so at the present there are 200 laws relating to the environment in the uk now these aren't just laws dedicated to nature conservation they're just laws surrounding the environment so these can be to do with waste management you know unnecessary pollution of areas so they're just kind of the generalized laws that protect and kind of maintain us from unnecessary destruction of the environment but there are a few key ones that look after you know our areas of natural beauty so the passing of the national parks and access to countryside act in 1949 actually includes geology and geomorphology within the government's brief so they were they basically said the requirement is to preserve the best examples of the important geological and geomorphological phenomenon so that they can continue to be used by earth scientists for research education and reference so this is really key because it actually includes geology and geomorphology as a category on its own rather than just kind of ignoring them and just putting it under biodiversity and then we also have the wildlife and countryside act in 1981 so this is the primary mechanism for wildlife protection in britain and then we have the countryside and rights of way act in 2000 which looks after areas of natural beauty and meets the demands for recreation so what's important about this is it doesn't want to comp uh, compromise the um, area's original purpose but it wants to just safeguard it from unnecessary damage so there's many different types of networks, uh, types of networks of protected areas in the UK, but I did come across this opinion from a book called A History of Nature Conservation in Britain. And in 1969, they said Britain is widely accepted as having the most comprehensive and the most advanced system of nature conservation in the world. In no other country is there so comprehensive a network and nowhere else is the cause of conservation so widespread. Now, I just thought this was a really inspirational opinion and I, I like to think it is true but i just thought it would be a nice way to introduce the next topic so there's many different types of protected areas and they can be split into different values so the most well known is biodiversity so there's many different categories for this and within this um kind of uh subject biodiversity other other values come into it so within biodiversity you might have scenic value or historical and cultural value or geodiversity as well they can all come under one bubble however we have since you know as conservation has developed we've split them into their own categories so there's many different types of biodiversity protected areas and then we have ones of scenic value and of course geological value so geological heritage can be um, categorized within these protected areas as either SSSI so these are sites of special scientific interest and there are 4,000 of these alone in England um, we can have RIGS which is regionally important geological sites and there's 56 of these in the UK and we can have geoparks so these are internationally recognized areas of geological value or we can have GSSPs which are global boundary stratotype section and point and now these are internationally recognized and there's 10 of these in Britain and what's key about these is they mark a point in geological time so they're really important for scientists because amongst all the strata and the rocks this is where the age changes that is kind of internationally um, known so these are recognized by this kind of golden spike here so you may have come across a few um, or you may not but uh, they are around in Britain so you will have to have a look for them in the future maybe 
So there are currently seven UNESCO geoparks in the UK. Now, geoparks were first founded in 2000 in response to a lack of recognition of geological heritage. However, UNESCO only supported the geopark initiative in 2015, but it's not legislative. So there is no law that comes with UNESCO labeling, um, but it does provide international recognition, which in turn comes with public awareness. And then, you know, the local laws and governments um, acts can you know lead to certain sites being protected and within the geoparks certain areas or monuments might be also under protection as well so this map here shows where the seven are distributed and then we also have national parks in the uk and these are protected under the national parks and access to countryside act in 1949 that i spoke about earlier and they have a high level of protection against inappropriate development through the planning system so development is key. We're trying to keep the area, you know, as much as we can as its natural state rather than, you know, putting up loads of new builds for our ever growing population. So I found this really useful, actually, this diagram. So this is a bit of a bit out of date. So this is from 2013, but I thought it was a really nice visual way of looking at protected areas in the UK. So we've got 11 percent as urban. So this is us. And then we've got 35 percent is protected land. So what uh, in terms of protected land, they're talking about national parks, areas of natural beauty, sites of significant scientific interest, etc. So, you know, a fair proportion of the UK is already under protection. But then we have more than half of England as you know, it's just not categorized yet. So if there's any proportion of this area here that should be protected, hopefully as time goes on, more of that will become green and will have a, you know, planning purpose, whether it is to just be left to, you know, do its thing or whether it's to be properly managed and protected. So there's quite a few responsible entities. So protection operates at a local, regional, national or international level, and it may be backed by legislation and international treaties or less formally by planning policy. So just kind of making sure that it can't be developed on. Um, and we have the IUCN National Committee, and that's the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So this helps to categorize the, the sites and the United Kingdom uh, it helps them focus on biodiversity in the natural environment and, you know, devolved responsibilities. And then we have the JNCC, which is the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, which actually advises the UK government on nature conservation and how to kind of, you know, progress and reach targets and make like a plan of how to look after it. And talking about plans, we now have the UK GAP, which is the Geodiversity Action Plans, which was created off the UK's um, Biodiversity Action Plans. And there is now a plan for the entire UK, which was created in 2006, and it's got a goal of enhancing the importance and role of geodiversity throughout the entire United Kingdom. So what this plan wants is for lots of different groups of people to work together to achieve a shared goal. And then also there are management plans which happen on a more local scale within national parks um, and more recently also national parks need to have an action plan as well as a management plan on how they you know propose to achieve sustainability and conserve their area so it's a collaborative effort so the future plans and goals for the uk we have the 2030 agenda of reaching sustainable development goals which is a historically agreed plan that many countries follow so this is probably a very optimistic plan but it's good to have you know a date to work towards and then if it takes longer at least you know targets and work is still being done to try and meet it and management plans, they tend to look ahead five to ten years um, and they set out goals for the future in order to maintain and conserve the nature and more recently the geology of the locality in question. So they just kind of make an achievable plan. And then, of course, the geodiversity action plans, which are trying to separate the importance of geodiversity from biodiversity so that it gets the recognition and management that it needs to keep it protected for our future generations. And the key thing about action plans is that they're very easily to under easy to understand. So the plan isn't for them to be only understandable by scientists or professionals. It's so that, you know, everyone can understand them and work towards this shared goal and achieve that protection for that area. So it's clear, manageable actions and very easy to follow stages. And it can be on a local level or it can be a regional level. 
So it, these action plans also provide guidance to the local councils on geodiversity and the priorities for geoconservation. So a lot of the time, because these are new and upcoming subjects, it's a lack of education. So if people understand what needs to be done to protect the areas, it's more likely to actually be a manageable target than if they don't understand something. So these action plans are really key, I think, in you know, creating a collaborative effort so that people feel more involved. But thank you so much for watching. That's just a little bit about the nature conservation of the UK. I know it's quite brief. It's quite a complex subject. So if you guys have any comments or questions, please feel free to put them down below. I'll also link in the description box my references and also some useful sites if you would like to know more on this subject. But thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed and there'll be more videos like this to come if you would like. So thank you again for watching and hopefully I'll see you next week.